Mirror of the Sea by Joseph Conrad The Weight of the Burden There has been a time when a chief's mate, pocketbook in hand and pencil behind his ear, kept one eye aloft upon his riggers and the other down the hatchway on the stevedores, and watched the disposition of the ship's cargo, knowing that even before she started he was already doing his best to secure for her an easy and quick passage. The hurry of the times, the loading and discharging organization of the docks, the use of hoisting machinery, which works quickly and will not wait, the cry for prompt dispatch, the very size of his ship, stand nowadays between the modern seaman and the thorough knowledge of his craft. There are profitable ships and unprofitable ships. The profitable ship will carry a large load through all the hazards of the weather, and, when at rest, will stand up and dock and shift from berth to berth without ballast. There is a point of perfection in a ship as a worker when she is spoken of as being able to sail without ballast. I have never met that sort of paragon myself, but I have seen these paragons advertised among ships for sale. Such excess of virtue and good nature on the part of a ship always provoked my mistrust. It is open to any man to say that his ship will sail without ballast, and he will say it, too, with every mark of profound conviction, especially if he is not going to sail in her himself. The risk of advertising her as able to sail without ballast is not great, since the statement does not imply a warranty of her arriving anywhere. Moreover, it is strictly true that most ships will sail without ballast for some little time before they turn turtle upon the crew. A ship owner loves a profitable ship. The seaman is proud of her. A doubt of her good looks seldom exists in his mind, but if he can boast of her more useful qualities, it is an added satisfaction for his self-love. The loading of ships was once a matter of skill, judgment, and knowledge. Thick books have been written about it. Stevens on Stowage is a portly volume with the renown and weight, in its own world, of Coke and Littleton. Stevens is an agreeable writer, and as is the case with men of talent, his gifts adorn his sterling soundness. He gives you the official teaching on the whole subject, is precise as to rules, mentions illustrative events, quotes law cases where verdicts turned upon a point of stowage. He is never pedantic, and, for all his close adherence to broad principles, he is ready to admit that no two ships can be treated exactly alike. Stevedoring, which had been a skilled labor, is fast becoming a labor without the skill. The modern steamship, with her many holds, is not loaded within the sailor-like meaning of the word. She is filled up. Her cargo is not stowed in any sense. It is simply dumped into her through six hatchways, more or less, by twelve winches or so, with clatter and hurry and racket and heat and a cloud of steam and a mess of coal dust. As long as you keep her propeller under water and take care, say, not to fling down barrels of oil on top of bales of silk or deposit an iron bridge girder of five ton or so upon a bed of coffee bags, you have done about all in the way of duty that the cry for prompt dispatch will allow you to do. The sailing ship, when I knew her in her days of perfection, was a sensible creature. When I say her days of perfection, I mean perfection of build, gear, seaworthy qualities, and case of handling, not the perfection of speed. That quality has departed with the change of building material. No iron ship of yesterday ever attained the marvels of speed which the seamanship of men famous in their time had obtained from their wooden copper-sheeted predecessors. 
Everything had been done to make the iron ship perfect, but no wit of man had managed to devise an efficient coating composition to keep her bottom clean with the smooth cleanness of yellow metal sheeting. After a spell of a few weeks at sea, an iron ship begins to lag as if she had grown tired too soon. It is only her bottom that is getting foul. A very little affects the speed of an iron ship which is not driven on by a merciless propeller. Often it is impossible to tell what inconsiderate trifle puts her off her stride. A certain mysteriousness hangs around the quality of speed as it was displayed by the old sailing ships commanded by a competent seaman. In those days the speed depended upon the seaman. Therefore, apart from the laws, rules, and regulations for the good preservation of her cargo, he was careful of his loading, or what is technically called the trim of his ship. Some ships sailed fast on an even keel. Others had to be trimmed quite one foot by the stern, and I have heard of a ship that gave her best speed on a wind when so loaded as to float a couple of inches by the head. I call to mind a winter landscape in Amsterdam, a flat foreground of wasteland, where here and there stacks of timber like the huts of a camp of some very miserable tribe, the long stretch of the handle skate, cold, stone-faced quays, with the snow-sprinkled ground and the hard, frozen water of the canal, in which were set ships, one behind another, with their frosty mooring ropes, hanging slack and their decks idle and deserted, because, as the master stevedore, a gentle, pale person with a few golden hairs on his chin and a reddened nose, informed me, their cargoes were frozen in up country on barges and skites. In the distance, beyond the waste ground, and running parallel with a line of ships, a line of brown, warm-toned houses seemed bowed under snow-laden roofs. From afar, the end of the Tsar Peter Strait issued in the frosty air the tinkle of bells of the horse tram cars appearing and disappearing in the opening between the buildings, like little toy carriages harnessed with toy horses and played with by people that appeared no bigger than children. I was, as the French say, biting my fists with impatience for that cargo frozen up country, with rage at the canal set fast, at the wintry and deserted aspect of all those ships that seemed to decay in grim depression for want of the open water. I was chief mate, and very much alone. Directly I had joined, I received from my owners instructions to send all the ship's apprentices away on leave together, because in such weather there was nothing for anybody to do, unless to keep up a fire in the cabin stove that was attended to by a snuffy and mop-headed, inconceivably dirty and weirdly toothless Dutch shipkeeper, who could hardly speak three words of English, but who must have had some considerable knowledge of the language, since he managed invariably to interpret, in the contrary sense, everything that was said to him. Notwithstanding the little iron stove, the ink froze on the swing table in the cabin, and I found it more convenient to go ashore stumbling over the Arctic wasteland and shivering in glazed tram cars in order to write my evening letter to my owners in a gorgeous cafe in the center of town. It was an immense place, lofty and gilt, upholstered in red plush, full of electric lights, and so thoroughly warmed that even the marble tables felt tepid to the touch. The waiter who brought me my cup of coffee bore, by comparison with my utter isolation, the dear aspect of an intimate friend. There alone, in a noisy crowd, I would write slowly, 
a letter addressed to Glasgow, of which the gist would be, there is no cargo and no prospect of any coming till late spring, apparently, and all the time I sat there the necessity of getting back to the ship bore heavily on my already half-congealed spirits. The shivering in glazed tram-cars, the stumbling over the snow-sprinkled waste-ground, the vision of ships frozen in a row, appearing vaguely like corpses of black vessels in a white world, so silent, so lifeless, so soulless they seemed to be. With precaution, I would go up the side of my own particular corpse, and would feel her as cold as ice itself and as slippery under my feet. My cold birth would swallow up like a chilly burial niche my bodily shivers and my mental excitement. It was a cruel winter. The very air seemed as hard and trenchant as steel, but it would have taken much more than this to extinguish my sacred fire for the exercise of my craft. No young man of twenty-four, appointed chief mate for the first time in his life, would have let that Dutch tenacious winter penetrate into his heart. I think that in those days I never forgot the fact of my elevation for five consecutive minutes. I fancy it kept me warm, even in my slumbers, better than the high pile of blankets, which positively crackled with frost as I threw them off in the morning, and I would get up early for no reason whatever except that I was in sole charge. The new captain had not been appointed yet. Almost each morning a letter from my owners would arrive, directing me to go to the charterers and clamor for the ship's cargo, to threaten them with the heaviest penalties of demurrage, to demand that this assortment of varied merchandise, set fast in a landscape of ice and windmills somewhere up country, should be put on rail instantly, and fed up to the ship in regular quantities every day. After drinking some hot coffee, like an Arctic explorer setting off on a sledge journey towards the North Pole, I would go ashore and roll shivering in a tram car into the very heart of the town, past clean-faced houses, past thousands of brass knockers, upon a thousand painted doors glimmering behind rows of trees of the pavement species, leafless, gaunt, haunting, seemingly dead forever. That part of the expedition was easy enough, though the horses were painfully glistening with icicles, and the aspect of the tram conductor's faces presented a repulsive blending of crimson and purple. But as to frightening or bullying, or even wheedling some sort of answer out of Mr. Huddig, that was another matter altogether. He was a big, swarthy Netherlander, with black mustaches and a bold glance. He always began by shoving me into a chair before I had time to open my mouth, gave me cordially a large cigar, and in excellent English would start to talk everlastingly about the phenomenal severity of the weather. It was impossible to threaten a man who, though he possessed the language perfectly, seemed incapable of understanding any phrase pronounced in a tone of remonstrance or discontent. As to quarreling with him, it would have been stupid. The weather was too bitter for that. His office was so warm, his fire so bright, his sides shook so heartily with laughter that I experienced always a great difficulty in making up my mind to reach for my hat. At last the cargo did come. At first it came dribbling in by rail in trucks till the thaw set in, and then fast in a multitude of barges with a great rush of unbound waters. The general master, Stevedore, had his hands very full at last, 
and the chief mate became worried in his mind as to the proper distribution of the weight of his first cargo in a ship he did not personally know before. Ships do want humoring. They want humoring and handling, and if you mean to handle them well, they must have been humored in the distribution of the weight which you ask them to carry through the good and evil fortune of a passage. Your ship is a tender creature, whose idiosyncrasies must be attended to if you mean her to come with credit to herself and you through the rough and tumble of her life. She seemed to think the new captain who arrived the day after we had finished loading on the very eve of the day of sailing. I first beheld him on the quay, a complete stranger to me, obviously not a Hollander in a black bowler and a short drab overcoat, ridiculously out of tone with the winter aspect of the wastelands, bordered by the brown fronts of houses with their roofs dripping with melting snow. This stranger was walking up and down, absorbed in the marked contemplation of the ship's fore and aft trim. But when I saw him squat on his heels in the slush at the very edge of the quay to peer at the draft of water under her counter, I said to myself, This is the captain. And presently I descried his luggage coming along, a real sailor's chest carried by means of rope beckets behind between two men with a couple of leather portamentos and a roll of charts sheeted in canvas piled upon the lid. The sudden spontaneous agility with which he bounded aboard right off the rail afforded me the first glimpse of his real character. Without further preliminaries, then a friendly nod, he addressed me. You have got her pretty well in her fore and aft trim. Now what about your weights? I told him I had managed to keep the weight sufficiently well up, as I thought, one-third of the whole, being in the upper part above the beams, as the technical expression has it. He whistled, phew, scrutinizing me from head to foot. A sort of smiling vexation was visible on his ruddy face. Well, we shall have a lively time of it this passage, I bet, he said. He knew. It turned out he had been chief mate of her for the two preceding voyages, and I was already familiar with his handwriting and the old log books I had been perusing in my cabin with a natural curiosity, looking up the records of my new ship's luck, of her behavior, of the good times she had had, and of the troubles she had escaped. He was right in his prophecy. Our passage from Amsterdam to Samarang, with the general cargo, of which, alas, only one-third in weight was stowed above the beams, we had a lively time of it. It was lively, but not joyful. There was not even a single moment of comfort in it, because no seaman can feel comfortable in body or mind when he has made his ship uneasy. To travel along with a cranky ship for ninety days or so is no doubt a nerve-trying experience, but in this case what was wrong with our craft was this, that by my system of loading she had been made much too stable. Neither before nor since have I felt a ship roll so abruptly, so violently, so heavily. Once she began, you felt that she would never stop, and this hopeless sensation, characterizing the motion of ships whose center of gravity is brought down too low in loading, made everyone on board weary of keeping on his feet. I remember once overhearing one of the hands say, By heavens, Jack! I feel as if I didn't mind how soon I let myself go and let the blamed hooker knock my brains out, if she likes. The captain used to remark frequently, Ah, yes, I dare say one-third weight above the beams would have been quite enough for most ships. But then, you see, there's no two of them alike on the seas, 
and she's an uncommonly ticklish jade to load. Down south, running before the gales of high latitudes, she made our life a burden to us. There were days when nothing would keep even on the swing tables, when there was no position where you could fix yourself so as not to feel a constant strain upon all the muscles of your body. She rolled and rolled with an awful dislodging jerk, and that dizzily fast sweep of her masts on every swing. It was a wonder that the men sent aloft were not flung off the yards, the yards not flung off the masts, the masts not flung overboard. The captain in his armchair, holding on grimly at the head of the table with a soup tureen, rolling on one side of the cabin and the steward sprawling on the other, would observe, looking at me, that's your one-third above the beams. The only thing that surprises me is that the sticks have stuck to her all this time. Ultimately, some of the minor spars did go, nothing important, spanker booms and such like, because at times the frightful impetus of her rolling would part a fourfold tackle of new three-inch manila line as if it were weaker than pack thread. It was only poetic justice that the chief mate who had made a mistake, perhaps a half-excusable one, about the distribution of his ship's cargo should pay the penalty. A piece of one of the minor spars that did carry away few against the chief mate's back and sent him sliding on his face for quite a considerable distance along the main deck. Thereupon followed various and unpleasant consequences of a physical order, queer symptoms as the captain who treated them used to say, inexplicable periods of powerlessness, sudden excesses of mysterious pain, and the patient agreed fully with the regretful mutters of his very attentive captain, wishing that it had been a straightforward broken leg. Even the Dutch doctor who took the case up in Samarang offered no scientific explanation. All he said was, Ah, friend, you are young yet. It may be very serious for your whole life. You must leave your ship. You must quite silent be for three months. Quite silent. Of course he meant the chief mate to be quiet, to lay up, as a matter of fact. His manner was impressive enough, if his English was childishly imperfect when compared with the fluency of Mr. Huddick, the figure at the other end of that passage, and memorable enough in its way. In a great airy ward of a far eastern hospital, lying on my back, I had plenty of leisure to remember the dreadful cold and snow of Amsterdam, while looking at the fronds of the palm trees, tossing and rustling at the height of the window, I could remember the elating feeling and the soul-gripping cold of those tramway journeys taken into town to pull what in diplomatic language is called pressure upon the good Huddock, with his warm fire, his armchair, his big cigar, and the never-failing suggestion in his good-natured voice. I suppose in the end it is you. They will appoint captain before the ship sails. It may have been his extreme good nature, the serious, unsmiling good nature of a fat, swarthy man with coal-black mustache and steady eyes, but he might have been a bit of a diplomatist too. His enticing suggestions I used to repel modestly by the assurance that it was extremely unlikely, as I had not enough experience. You know very well how to go about business matters, he used to say, with a sort of affected moodiness, clouding his serene round face. I wonder whether he ever laughed to himself after I had left the office. I dare say he never did, because I understand that diplomists in and out of the career take themselves and their tricks with an exemplary seriousness. 
but he had nearly persuaded me that I was fit in every way to be trusted with a command. There came three months of mental worry, hard rolling remorse and physical pain to drive home the lesson of, of insufficient experience. Yes, your ships want to be humored with knowledge. You must treat with an understanding consideration the mysteries of her feminine nature, and then she will stand by you faithfully in the unceasing struggle with forces wherein defeat is no shame. It is a serious relation, that in which a man stands to his ship. She has her rights as though she could breathe and speak, and indeed there are ships that for the right man will do anything but speak, as the saying goes. A ship is not a slave. You must make her easy in a seaway. You must never forget that you owe her the fullest share of your thought, of your skill, of your self-love. If you remember that obligation, naturally and without effort, as if it were an instinctive feeling of your inner life, she will sail, stay, run for you as long as she is able, or, like a sea bird going to rest upon the angry waves, she will lay out the heaviest gale that ever made you doubt living long enough to see another sunrise.